Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you for the revelation and truth that you are releasing to us and that which we will see uh, and hear uh, and experience because of the proclamation and declaration of your word in the next few moments. Father, I pray that you would make all of us good soil. Father, I ask you, Lord, that all of us would be open to receive your word, but that we would not just hear your word, but it would take root in our heart and literally cause change in our lives, cause us to change the way we live because of the power of your Holy Spirit. Now, Father, I pray for your anointing and your spirit to rest upon me, even though I know it is in me. I ask you also that you allow your, your presence, your spirit, your anointing to rest upon me, the grace to proclaim your word. Now, I pray as always that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And because of your goodness and mercy, would you save people both in this room and watching online around the world? In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Um, there is something that I forgot to do uh, that I wanted to do uh, earlier, and I forgot to do it. And so I know uh, for the editing sake of, of video later, which, by the way, you guys <laughs> had a whole meltdown. <laughs> on YouTube because last week's service did not stay up. And I'm like, we want to make sure you get the word, guys. We want to make sure you get the word. So don't be mad. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. All right. <laughs> we need the word. Um, I kind of I kind of joked around a little bit and I said, we just can't soak in his presence all day. We got to wash too. <laughs> wash with the water of the word. <laughs> so I love the presence of God, but we can't just soak. We also got to wash. Amen. We need the word. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, there are two people that I want to acknowledge uh, in this room uh, that are joining us from our, our online family around the world. Uh, that is Demarcus Cruz and AJ. Can you guys stand? They are a blessing. For those of you deeper global family online, you know, you know that they are a blessing. Now. Let me just say this to the family that's here, because you drive from where you drive from. When people fly to come home, it's a big deal, and we should, we should let them know how welcome they are. So can we welcome them one more time? Yeah. Now, if there are any other Deeper Global family members online from outside of the Central Florida region, <laughs> and you are here, and I don't know about it, I'm not trying to not shout you out, I literally did not know. So if you are another Deeper Global family member online, can you stand so we can acknowledge you too? Anybody in the room? Anybody in the room? Anybody in the room? Okay. I, I just want to make sure, because I want to I don't want you to come home and be offended. Like, they didn't even acknowledge me. We did not know. <laughs> But if you are here, we wanted to acknowledge you. Okay. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the past few weeks, we have been spending time in this particular passage of the scripture as we've been layering this idea uh, of intentional growth. And specifically, we've been focusing on 2 Peter chapter 3, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 11, and we've been layering it over and over, kind of taking it a little bit slower, uh, taking certain verses, taking certain phrases, and giving us uh, a true understanding of what this scripture has been saying. And before going into the kinds of things that we could be doing for intentional growth, uh, we, we slow down a little bit so that we can understand what we've received first that empowers us or enables us to grow in God. God is not expecting us to grow on our own, but instead he's empowered us to do so. And so I've been sitting with the stunning truth that we've been given everything we need for living a godly life. And when you recognize that we've been given everything we need for a godly life, it literally changes how you see yourself. You ought to see yourself and know that you are not powerless. You ought to see yourself and know that you are not alone. When you, when you place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you changed. 
Uh, I, let me say that again in the room of believers. When you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you changed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, a new species of being. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have been made new. And so because of that change, the change that has happened in us uh, is the fact that, that we receive Christ. Now, when I say we receive Christ, um, it's important because some of us were like, well, when I came to Jesus. No, no, no. He not only found you, he entered you. He empowered you. Therefore, I made a statement last week that I repeat again that God is not expecting you to do what he has not empowered you to do. God has not expecting you to do what he has not empowered you to do, but there converse, there is a, a, a converse uh, response to that. Because we've been empowered by God to do it, we are expected to live godly lives. That is an expectation. Because we've been empowered by God to live a godly life, we are expected to live a godly life. Now, it's been really interesting because I, I shared this uh, in our first gathering, and, and I'll share it again here, um, that, that of late I have really made a, an intentional effort um, to change my vernacular uh, as it relates to who is a Christian. Now, that is not me sitting in a judgment seat or, or trying to determine who I think is real and not real and right and not right and all that kind of stuff. I am not God. Uh, however, I have begun to, to change uh, my vernacular about this. And the main reason or the main catalyst, in addition to observation, uh, the main catalyst that caused me to change my vernacular as it relates to, to who is a Christian uh, is actually my children. And the reason that, that my children became the catalyst is because um, sometimes uh, be because someone says that they are a Christian or someone says that they love God or someone says that they follow God or they just happen to mention God uh, automatically, particularly because they have placed their faith in Christ, but they're still young and still learning uh, that not everybody means what they say and do what they say. Um, a lot of times, whenever somebody says something, um, in order to justify their interaction uh, with said individuals, whether that be uh, in life or uh, on, on, on TV or whatever, um, they'll be maybe watching something and they'll say, oh, don't worry, Dad, they're fine, they're a Christian. And I begin to change my vernacular as it relates to that. And, and, and they say, well, they are a Christian. I say, well, they say they are. They say they are, um, but, but there is a difference between those who say they are and that's actually those who actually are. Um, there, there is a truth because we, we live in a day right now, we live in a nation. I know that, that people watch us from all around the world and, and there are different realities in different nations. I can speak to the context in which I live in. While I do pay attention to the context in other places, I can specifically speak to the context in which I live in. In the nation that I live in, there are a lot of people who identify as Christian verbally that have no fruit to actually back that up. In other words, if they were to be put on trial, Pastor Caleb uh, preached something about that uh, a while ago about what would they find, but, but if they were to be put on trial uh, to, to see whether or not they could be found guilty for being a Christian, there actually wouldn't be much proof or evidence to convict them of being a Christian other than what they say. We, we have quite a bit of enmeshment as it relates to those who speak about God or those who speak about Christ who actually don't show the fruit of it. And so, therefore, it begins to beg the question then, uh, who then is saved or, or what makes a Christian? It was a conversation that I was having with my kids around the dinner table as it relates to what makes a Christian. And one of the things uh, that, that is important for us to say is that salvation bears fruit. In other words, there is fruit of salvation. Somebody say, there is fruit of salvation. In Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 11, Paul is praying uh, for uh, the church there, and he says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. There should be fruit in your life once you are saved. We, we, are, we are saved, we are changed, we are given everything we need for living a godly life, but then there 
there is to be a growth uh, that begins to produce a fruit in our life or a fruit of salvation. And so there is what we've been talking about, which is intentional growth. But as we start to talk about intentional growth, even around the table uh, with my kids, they begin to ask, well, well how do you grow uh, in that way? So I want to tell you uh, basically what I told them because all of us need it. And I want to be simple, but it is important. Intentional growth happens through intentional submission. Intentional growth happens through intentional submission. Now, what are we talking about? Submission to what? I've been sitting with this stunning truth and this stunning reality that it is important for us to sit with. And that is the fact that when we are saved, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, the mystery of the indwelling Christ becomes unlocked in your life, uh, which is what the scripture says that Christ is in you. Somebody say it. Christ is in me. Christ is in me. Say it again. I need you to sit with this stunning reality for just a moment because if you will actually embrace this stunning reality that when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you died so that he could live that Christ is in you, that he empowers you, which is why we made the statement that God does not expect you to do what he's not empowered you to do. How has he empowered you to do it? He empowered you to do it by giving you himself. He knew that by yourself, you could not do it. So what he did, knowing that he is perfect, he comes into you, lives his life through you, and he empowers you to do it. As Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, this message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles, and this this is the secret. This is the mystery of the indwelling Christ. Christ lives in you. In addition to that, Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So we have this right reality and revelation. Christ lives in us. And Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 tells us that God is working in us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 as we've been reading for several weeks. For by by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. In other words, God, when he, the scripture says by his divine power, he's given us everything we need for a godly life. What is he talking about? He's talking about himself. God is saying, I gave you me. That is amazing to me. God is not expecting me to be godly without God. Can I say it again? God is not expecting you to be godly without God. But because he gave you himself, he is expecting you to live a godly life. Now, there's a truth that most of us know. No one has to read it to us. No one has to tell us because I can preach this to you. I can, I can get excited. I can be animated. I can say all of that. But when you, uh, you don't even have to step outside of this room. Probably while I'm preaching, some of you are having to rebuke thoughts in your mind. Because there is a war. Now, now let me help you. Uh, the fact that there is a war on the inside of you tells you that he's in you. Because if he was not in you, there would be no war. I know some of y'all, you're like, I'm struggling today. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Be grateful that you're struggling. Because other people are not struggling against their captor. They're slaves. The fact that you can struggle at all says that there is a more powerful nature in me than the sin nature that I used to walk in. This powerful nature has enabled me to choose Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. You know this, you've heard this, let me read it again. When I say you know this, you heard this, I'm, I'm specifically talking about those uh, who read the scripture, been believers for a while, uh, maybe some of you are in here, you've never heard this before, um, you've been slaved, enslaved to sin, and, and I'm about to show you that you don't have to be that way. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. 
Now, now, we were having this conversation again uh, in my house uh, with my kids, and they were talking about, well, well, how how do you how do you know that you are saved? And so we begin to talk about uh, fruit, and and when we begin to talk about uh, fruit and the reality of evidence or proof of your salvation, there is another reality too that there is must be. Submission, I'll say that again, the mic just cut out for a second. Submission to the Spirit. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. Now some of y'all, you've been saved for a long, long time, so you'll never admit that. You're like, "Mm -mm, no, no, I'm holy. Okay. But for the honest people. (laughs) <laughs> there are daily decisions that you have to make every day. I don't want to get ahead of myself. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite, just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild party, and other sins like these. I love the other sins like these because Paul basically knew that there was going to come a time where people would just make up sins. He said, if it ain't in there, other sins like these. (laughs) But let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In other words, um, as Peter would write it, make every effort. Make every effort. But what Peter then says, um, he goes on, this is Paul, of course, writing in Galatians, as we've been studying in 2 Peter chapter 1, um, there is this reality that there, there is a level of proof or evidence that should flow from the believer's life. Uh, Paul wrote it this way, the spirit produces this kind of fruit, the sinful nature or the flesh produces this kind of fruit, and so you can know which one you're walking in based on the evidence of your life. Peter says, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Uh, And he begins to go on to talk about how we can now show evidence or proof. In other words, what is the scripture saying to us? Make every effort to show or reveal evidence of your salvation. Make every effort for there to be a proof of your salvation. How do you know that you are saved? Because when you are saved, there is fruit, there is evidence, there is proof. It's not just an external thing that you do. It's an internal reality. And so what what the scripture says is then supplement or add to your faith. And it goes on to list these things. Add to your faith evidence or proof of your faith. And they don't just happen without intentionality. Um, we, we said this uh, in, in, in weeks prior. We don't just grow by existing. We don't just grow over time. We don't just grow because we get older. We, we don't just grow because we go to church. We, we don't just grow because we listen to a podcast. Although these things can help you and aid you if you are intentional. But if you are just present and allowing it to hit your head but never hit your heart, you are not growing. Spiritual growth, hear me family, is to be pursued. Spiritual growth is to be pursued. Now, I want you to understand how it is pursued. How do we pursue spiritual growth? Especially since we've established that we're not talking about works. 
We're, we're not talking about the external striving of works in order to try to please God through our effort or full people. So, so we're not talking about striving. So then if we're not talking about striving in that way, when we talked about working and striving and that kind of thing, we talked about it in a different methodology. If we're not talking about it in that way, how then do we pursue spiritual growth? Spiritual growth is pursued through an intentional effort of submission to the lordship and the leadership of Christ and the death of the sinful nature known as the flesh. How is spiritual growth pursued? It is pursued through the intentional effort of submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me say it a different way. The more submitted you are, the more evidence there is. Can I say that again? The more submitted you are, the more evidence there is. The more submitted you are, the more proof there is of salvation. I want you to know something when you, when you see people living victoriously. When you see people walking this out, I want you to know something. <laughs> Anytime you see anyone bearing fruit or showing evidence of their salvation, know that what you are actually seeing is private victories being manifest. Can I, can I say that again? Can I say that again? Anytime you see anyone bearing fruit or showing evidence of their salvation, know that what you are actually seeing is private victory being manifest. It is their private victories that are showing evidence. Okay, this is why the scripture says, I, I read it earlier, we read it earlier. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, you will never fall away. I'm going to read it again. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, and you will never fall away. So if we're not talking about works, what does work hard mean? If we're not talking about works, if we're not talking about external elbow grease, if we're not talking about, about willpower, if we're not talking about trying to, to uh, live an external facade that fools church people, and as soon as we get in the car, we turn into something else, what does work hard mean? And some of y'all laughing because you know. What is the hard work? What is the hard work then? Let me define it for you. It is the moment-by-moment -moment decisions to deny yourself. You notice I did not say the day-by-day -day decisions. I said the moment-by-moment -moment decisions to deny yourself. Galatians tells us or to deny yourself the sinful nature in the flesh in submission to what pleases the Spirit. Let me finish that up. It is the moment-by-moment -moment decisions to deny yourself the sinful nature and the flesh in submission to what pleases the Spirit. Galatians tells us that these two natures are at war with each other, and they are at war with each other moment by moment, not day by day. Because how many of you know you could be having a good day and then a moment enter that day? And now you have a decision in that moment. Am I going to please God or am I going to do what I feel? I, I need to help us because it, that is a moment. That my brothers and sisters, is the hard work. The easy part to our flesh is to ignore this Bible, to ignore the Spirit, and do what we feel. You know, we've seen this in real life, in, in natural life, and so it is in the Spirit. Especially, you'll find this out the older you get. Oftentimes, the right thing and the hard thing are the same thing. Can I say it again? Oftentimes, the right thing and the hard thing are the same thing. If you are waiting for God to make it easy for you, your flesh will never think that it's easy to die. Your flesh will never want to apologize. Your flesh wants to be right all the time. 
It doesn't want to ever be wrong. Your flesh will choose gratification of itself every time. Your flesh will choose dessert every time. Your flesh will choose sleep every time. Your flesh will choose Netflix over prayer every time. Your flesh will choose a fiction book over the Bible every time. If you are waiting for your flesh to come in line with the spirit, it doesn't come in line. It must be killed. It must be denied. There is a moment-by-moment decision. That is the hard work. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. We are not talking about labor. We are talking about submission. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Now, consistent decisions in private will eventually produce evidence in public. Can I say it again? I know I'm repeating some stuff here, but consistent decisions in private will eventually produce evidence in public. Now, The truth is, the consistent decisions to submit to the Spirit will produce evidence in public. And consistent decisions to ignore the Spirit will produce evidence in public. Do you know why this generation, and I'm I'm assuming it's more than this generation, um, I just happen to live in this generation. Um, This generation now, I'm speaking, I know that there are four generations, four to five generations alive on earth right now. This is the general terminology. When I say generation, I'm talking about everyone alive. This generation does not like the the terminology of judging. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Why? Because... The evidence is revealing the private decisions, which is dismantling the facade that you've had. So you don't like it when something points to the fact that you're not praying, when something points to the fact that you're not submitted, when something points to the fact that you're not reading. Now, I'm not talking about when you slip up. I'm talking about your consistent behavior. Because sometimes you, you, you have a moment where you don't make the right choice. You don't submit to the Spirit, you go off. You're like, don't come for me till I call for you. You just go off. <laughs> but the evidence of the Spirit is also that when you go off, you go back and you apologize. It's a moment-by-moment decision. I I made a decision in the moment that did not honor God, that did not please the Spirit, and now because I made a decision that did not honor God and please the Spirit, He's on me now. I'm away from you. I felt good right then. I done told them. I let them have it. You get in the car and the Holy Spirit like, oh, yeah? I could have let you have it. I could have left you where you were in your mess. I could have left you in your sin. Oh, did you forget that the very thing you went off on them about you used to do? Go back. <laughs> moment by moment. We don't, we, don't, we don't like it because sometimes it reveals the private decisions. But can I tell you something? Anyone showing fruit is also revealing work. Work hard to show the evidence of your salvation. Proof. Salvation bears fruit. Anyone showing fruit is revealing work. They are revealing what they've done in private. When you see fruit, fruit doesn't always manifest right away. It takes time. My children tried to grow an apple tree in a cup. (laughs) They took some soil and put in a seed, and it did sprout something, but it was never gonna produce an apple. Because, number one, it wasn't in the right environment. That's just, let's just talk about that. But, but in addition to that, it's not just the right environment, it takes time. Consistent, underground work, 
consistent, intentional growth, consistent, intentional root work before you see fruit. So whenever you see fruit, what you're actually seeing is private decisions. Whenever you see somebody walking in the power of God, and by the power of God, I'm not talking about the external movements of God that happen in a church. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the power of God, because God can use people to get to other people, bypassing those people's lives because he loves the other people in the room. So just because you see somebody that's flowing prophetically does not mean they're living right. I'm just thinking, if a donkey can talk, maybe the fact that you're speaking for God might not be as big of a deal as you think. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you are seeing, when you see people walking in the power of God, what is the power of God? It, it is the ability to keep to, to have self-control, to, to not sin, to, to submit to the Spirit in a moment when everybody else is going a different way. That's the power of God at work. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So when you see somebody walking in the power of God, what you are seeing is what they have done in private. Now, can, can I get some help to preach real quick? Can I, show, can I show you something? Can I show you something? Okay, so this, this weekend... Um, I ministered in Phoenix, Arizona. And when I ministered in Phoenix, um, for the first time, uh, uh, Warren came with me to Phoenix. It was amazing. It's, he did great. I always travel with a musician. It's like traveling with home court advantage. No matter what the atmosphere is, we can change it. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so I, I travel with home court advantage. So um, I was, we were, were passing some of the sports stadiums in Phoenix. And so, um, you know, learning more about Warren and spending that time, I was asking, hey, man, are you into sports? And he's like, no, nah, I, I don't, I'm not into sports. And, and I, he basically said, you know, I'm, I, I root for whoever's winning. <laughs> so I said, I get that. But what also immediately came to me was I, I know, I know about the gift that Warren has. Um, the gift that Warren has is, is wider than most of you are aware of. Um, and so because of that, um, what I knew is, of course, that makes sense that you don't watch sports. And of course, it makes sense that you don't watch this and do that. Why? Because I know that you cannot have the kind of gift that Warren has without being committed to it first in private. What you actually see in public is a display of the decisions that he made in private. So, like, and, and I, Warren's going to preach in a moment. Or he's going to help me preach. How about that? <laughs> now, I play too. Most people don't know that. Um, I'm not about to. <laughs> and, and when Warren came, he thought, because he saw a video of me singing and playing, and he thought I was faking because he didn't know I could actually play. But my mom can tell you that, that I used to play piano until my fingers would swell and bruise and bleed. Yes, that was what I did. Um, I played and played and played. Most of you don't know. Um, there are other people in, in other, other eons of life long ago uh, that know me as a musician, not as a pastor. Um, um, I used to travel around the world first, not leading worship, playing for those who were. Nobody knew. So, so I knew then, I said all that to say that I knew, I know the sacrifice it takes in order to have what he carries. Now, most of us will say, oh, man, what a joy when we see him play and everything else. But what you don't get to see is what happens behind the scenes. You, you don't know what happens behind. What you are actually seeing is the evidence of what he does in private, which is hours upon hours upon hours of practice. That's why Imani is so amazing. Where's she at? She's over there. Because to be married to a musician is to be married to someone who loves you and... <laughs> 
<laughs> and music and, and, and playing and, and doing all of those things. So I, I wanted you to see something because what most people do is they say, I just shouted you out because you're amazing. Um, <laughs> I just shouted you out because you're just amazing. And so that's Imani right there. Work hard to show or to prove that you really are among those who God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. What is hard work? It is moment-by-moment decisions to deny yourself the sinful nature, the flesh, and submission to what pleases the spirit. It's a consistent decision in private that eventually produces evidence in public. Now, here is where most of us get tripped up. We think that what we are seeing is a gift we don't know that what we are seeing is the decisions in private in order to, to nurture the gift. You and I have been given a gift. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. For God, by his divine power, has given you everything you need in order to live a godly life. You and I have the same thing. When you see people who are walking in victory, you are not just seeing gifted people. You are seeing submitted ones. I know, oh, oh gosh, I know that you feel like there, there are some gifted orators. There are some gifted preachers. There are some gifted preachers that don't actually put in time in study. Some. But there are some who are significantly gifted, who also put in hours upon hours upon hours of study. It is not just the gift that gets up here. It's decisions in private. Okay? Let me give you an example, and then I'm going to let Warren preach. Um, one of the ways that I knew I had the right wife, one of the many ways I knew I had the right wife, is that for the last 30 years, 31 years, my Saturday nights have belonged to the Lord. The last 31 years of my life, my Saturday nights belong to the Lord. Um, I was thinking when I met my wife, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, I was thinking to myself when I met my wife, okay, well, she's my wife. You know, what, what we do together is honors the Lord. Our marriage is worship, all that kind of stuff. Um, I could go out with her on a Saturday night. And we tried. And I went out at dinner. But when that time came, that was the God time that I literally had reserved for him. I was trying to be present, but my mind was also on the Lord. And my wife said to me, hey, I know this is, your God time. I don't want to interrupt your God time. So why don't you go home and spend time with God? I'll still be here. Well, y'all ain't got to clap for it. I will. You say, why do you tell that story, Pastor? What does it have to do with anything? It, this was, this, this, this preaching stuff is not something that we do because we're gifted because I'm not the most gifted. There are some incredibly gifted people, orators, communicators, everything else. But one thing I am is committed. Amen. Committed. Which means that there are decisions that happen behind the scenes that produce what you see. When you see him, what you are seeing is an internal decision. Now, I want to demonstrate something because it is broader than you think. Go ahead. I just want to point out what you're seeing 
because some of y'all don't even know what's happening. You know, keep moving. He's making a loop right now. Now, sometimes on Sundays in the services, you don't even know that he's been doing that, creating. So what you're actually hearing is more than what he's originally playing because he plays something and then he adds to it. Let me tell you something. First of all, he's one of the rarest people that does that live and in person. Most people do that where no one else can see them, but the reason why he can do that in public is because of what he did in private. But now, you think you, think you know the extent. Can you go over there? Take over that part. Can you take over that part? You think you know the extent of what happens in private?
Luke, come here. Luke, take over. You think you know the extent? Warren, can you go right here?
the proof of your salvation. How does that happen? Private submission. What are you seeing? Private practice that produces public evidence. Private practice that produces public evidence. Now, because I'm a musician, you can sit down for a second. You're like, oh, let us go home. Oh. I'm going to let you go home. This is going to be faster than you think. I'm going to let you go home. It's going to be faster than you think. I need you to see something. Because most of us don't recognize the gift we've been given. That's Christ in us. When we are saved, the imperative of Scripture, make every effort, work hard to show. What are we doing? It's the private decision. Anytime you see somebody giving evidence, what you are seeing is the private decisions. So then, there's these seven supplemental things that he says are proofs or evidence or adds to your faith. It doesn't make your faith better. What it did do, it, it, it makes your faith sure. Did you hear what I just said? He's not saying that faith is not good enough. What he's saying is that it makes it sure. Can I do this quickly? Can I do it quickly? Some of y'all like, yes. And others of y'all like, we don't believe you can. I felt the shade in the room. I just, I'm about to forget y'all then. I, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'll come back. I said, I love you guys. <laughs> Say this with me. Anyone showing fruit is also revealing work. Say it again. Anyone showing fruit it's also revealing work. What is the work? Submission. Moment by moment submission. Work hard. Moment by moment submission. Work hard. Moment by moment submission. Work hard to prove. What is it? Moment by moment submission. Say it with me again. Anyone revealing fruit is also showing work. Y'all not saying it like you believe it. Anyone showing fruit it's also revealing work. What is the work? Submission to the Holy Spirit when? I'm trying to, to get this to stick with you. I'm trying to get this to stick with you. Anyone showing fruit? It's also revealing work. What is that work? When? What is the work? Submission. To who? Love. When? Love. What is the work? Submission. To who? Love. When? Love. How do we grow by intentional submission to the Spirit moment by moment? How do we grow spiritually? by intentional submission to the Holy Spirit moment by moment. And what happens when we grow? What happens when we make those intentional decisions? After a while, there is evidence. Evidence. Now, if you don't, after a while, there is still evidence. <laughs> I wish you would get this. Um, 
You can eat cookies every day. And the first little while, well, it depends on if you're over 40 or not, but <laughs> in the first little while, there might not be any external evidence. But after a while, that decision will show evidence. Just like submitting to the Spirit shows evidence of fruit or proof of your salvation, not submitting to the Spirit eventually will show evidence. Now, when I say cookies, you think about outward evidence. Let's say pizza. Pizza can have an outward evidence, but it can also have an inward evidence called cholesterol which clogs your arteries and gives you a heart attack. It may not show up because you might look like you're in shape because you got a high metabolism. You were, you, were, you were born slender, and no matter what you eat, it doesn't show up on the outside, so everybody thinks you're good. It's the same way spiritually. There are people who every, everybody thinks they're good, but they're going to stand before the Lord. He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because we don't do what we do for others. We do what we do for the Lord. So how then do we grow? By intentional submission to the Spirit, moment by moment. Did y'all get that? So here is some of the evidence. Some of the evidence. I'm going to go through this quickly and then I'm going to give it up. Because Warren helped us preach and the band helped us preach. And after a while, the things and the decisions that you make in private will show up in public. God will use it. Okay, last week we talked about moral excellence. Seven supplemental things that are evidence, proofs, add to your salvation, add to your faith, supplement, add to evidence. Moral excellence, we said we spent the majority of our time on moral excellence. Why did we spend the majority of our time on, on moral excellence? Number one, because the world needs a difference. Number two, because it's the first external sign of an in inward transformation, that you actually do what's right. The righteous do righteousness. Did you hear what I said? The righteous do righteousness. But in this, there is, there is another, there are, there are six more. I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. I thought I was going to spend all this time talking about all these things, but I want you to read the scripture for yourself, and you'll see pursue these things. How do you pursue these things? Moment by moment, submission to the Holy Spirit. That's how you work hard. You got it? Y'all so quiet, y'all ready to go. Processing. Somebody said processing. Knowledge. Knowledge. Supplement your faith with moral excellence and to moral excellence, knowledge. Now, I studied knowledge for the last four weeks, I didn't like how I was going to communicate it because it was scholarly. And I didn't like the scholarly explanation of it. I needed something. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And then I happened to be reading, shameless plug, The Awe of God. When John Bevere in The Awe of God begin to link knowledge with intimacy. Knowledge of the Lord with intimacy. Anybody, did anybody else see that, y'all? Yes. Knowledge of the Lord with intimacy. He, he pulled out Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2 through 5. Turn your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain a knowledge of God. And then he goes on to extrapolate the fact that the word knowledge is defined in the, by the dictionary of biblical languages as information of a person with a strong implication of relationship to that person. Or the Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary tells us that this word implies that have an intimate, experiential knowledge of God. To simply state what's promised, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowing God intimately. So when he says, um, add to your faith to supplement your faith, moral excellence with knowledge, uh, the reason why these things are connected is because when you know God, you please God. The, the, the more intimate you are with the person, the more you know about what makes them tick, about what pleases them, about what upsets them, about what hurts them, about what bothers them. And, and if you love them, you do none of those things that would bother or hurt them. Whenever you see people having arguments about is this a sin or is it not a sin, the question is does it please him? 
Would it hurt him? Do you know him? Because at some level or another, there comes a point where intimacy with him says, I get the fact that other people might do this, but as for me, I know him too well to actually live this way. I, I know him too well to entertain these thoughts. I, I know him too well to enter that conversation. I know him too well for that. I don't want to do what displeases or hurts or grieves the Spirit of God. As the scripture would tell us in Ephesians, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Which is to say that you actually can. I know that, that most of you just feel like, well, he's just some inanimate object up in heaven that just has no feelings. And the scripture says that you can grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. So when you know him, you don't do the things that you know grieve him. And if you do something that you know that grieves him, yet repentance then is not a chore. It's something that literally you, you say, I, I've got to come back to you. I, I know that I hurt you when I did this. I know that this was wrong. I know that you saw it. I know that nobody else saw it. Nobody else saw me entertain that thought, but you saw me entertain that thought. No one else saw me uh, decide that I wasn't going to pray today because I was mad by what you did. Oh, y'all. Okay. Knowledge. Knowledge to know him. You can look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 5 through 11 as it relates to how Paul talks about knowing God. But I'm going to run fast. I'm going to run fast. Number three was self-control. Self-control. I had a ton of scriptures on self-control. But what I really discovered is that when you have an intimate knowledge of God, it leads to self-control. When you have an intimate knowledge of God, it leads to self-control. Because we are partakers of the divine nature, which we talked about earlier uh, in, in our time together, going through 2 Peter chapter 1, it talks about the, being partakers or partners. Uh, that means that Christ's victory is our victory. The reason why we can have self-control is because we've been set free from, from the slavery to sin. Therefore, we can actually walk with self-control because his victory is our victory. We are not powerless. We are not powerless. Somebody say, I have self-control. It's been given to me by God who lives in me. Fourth, patient endurance, also known as perseverance. Endurance. Let me give you a way to define endurance. We've defined it in the past as peace, perseverance, as peace with God's timing. Let me give you another. Endurance would be seeing time through God's eyes. Seeing time through God's eyes. What is endurance? Seeing time through God's eyes. What are these things? They are evidence of our salvation. When you live this way, it is evidence. Now, can I talk about this? Just let me, let me, I'm, Remind me to come back to the, the thought I just was about to have, one of y'all. Y'all don't know what the thought was, but just say, go back to that thought. Okay. <laughs> and like, I don't even know what the thought is, but go back to it. Godliness. I'm doing this quickly. Godliness, which is reverence towards God and fellow men. Godliness, reverence towards God and fellow men. It is devotion to God or an awareness of God in every aspect of life. It is living your life with a God awareness. What is living your life with a God awareness? It is evidence. It is proof. Six, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, which is, which is interesting because it is the outworking of godliness. It is, it is the term Philadelphian. Now, I, anybody from Philadelphia here? Can I offend all of you? It was like, a city of brotherly love. They say there's no racism in Philadelphia because everybody hates everybody. <laughs> the Philadelphians were like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Philadelphian is this, in the Greek, it is a combination word. It's a combination word, phileo and adelphos. Adelphos means from the same womb. Now you say, uh, we're not from the same womb. What it is indicating is from the same source. 
when you are born again, you come from the same source. So you love one another as if you are brother and sister actually. Now, for me, this is a revelation because I'm my only child. I shared it in the first gathering as well. My wife has helped me because she's not an only child. So when our, when our um, children go at it, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is World War III. And she's like, this is normal for siblings. I'm like, what? I'm going to cut you. I'm a, and it's like, okay, wait. No. Of course, they've never said that before. They've never said that before. Thank God. <laughs> I'm going to cut your toe off. I'm going to cut your hand off. It, it, it escalates. And she's like, that's normal. And I'm like, what? But we've noticed something about this love that they have for one another. They can be going at it and five minutes later playing together as if nothing ever happened. Because they're like, at the end of the day, you're my brother and my sister. Now, this is important. We don't let it just go on and on because, you know, at some point it can go to the point where they're like, you know what, I'm not talking to you no more. So I, I, I made the statement, like, I really want our kids, and we pray about this, both my wife and I, to actually be friends and like each other when they get older. And, like, I, I, have, I have an internal desire, um, a prayer. In addition to my kids walking with the Lord, I actually want them to like each other and us enough to come back home to Thanksgiving when they're adults. Yeah, brotherly love from the same source. Look at the person next to you. <laughs> Say, now, even if it's your spouse, I need you to understand this because in heaven, we're not married. If y'all never read that, it's in the Bible. <laughs> See, some of y'all, y'all getting divorced too early. You need to wait. <laughs> Ooh, I only got six more years with you. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be free from you. <laughs> That's a whole mess. <laughs> the scripture says that we will not be given to marriage in heaven. And that way we'll be like the angels. Okay, so even if you are talking to your spouse right now, tell them, now listen, if they are a woman, then they are your sister. If they are a man, then they are your brother. There's nothing in between. Okay, all right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so I don't know which one you're looking at, so you insert properly brother or sister right there and say, whether you like it or not, you are my. Because we came from the same source. I know we don't we don't we don't like it but when you receive a new birth you receive a new spirit and that binds your hearts and your lives in love as a family of God even if you don't know each other you might have looked at somebody that you do not know and and you may be from different parts of the world but there is supposed to be in the body of Christ a love for one another and what is that it is evidence it's work hard to show the results of your salvation. That means that sometimes that very person that you just talked to might do something and you're going to have to make an in-the-moment decision to submit to the Spirit versus your feelings in order to grow spiritually. I don't like what you did. I don't like what you said. But in this moment, I submit to the Holy Spirit and I forget. Are y'all still here? Let me give you this last one. Um, and then I'm going to go back to that thought. Um, the last one is love. It is different from brotherly love because love in this context is actually speaking of the agape of God, which actually then is the highest level of maturity you can walk in. Most of us, until you have a deep, true 
understanding of the gospel um, really don't understand this. So agape love is love regardless of feelings, love even if the person doesn't deserve to be loved. We can see this in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 10, and then I'm, I'm literally, literally almost finished. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for us sinners. This is the agape of God. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. You say, how is that agape? Well, agape is love for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? All of us, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Agape is also love for the unworthy. Who are the unworthy? It's all of us sinners. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that's who we were when his love came after us. What is agape love? It is love for the undeserving, which is Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Love for the ungodly, love for the unworthy, love for the undeserving. And that's how we are supposed to love, but we'll never love that way until we see that that's who we were. We the ungodly, the unworthy, the undeserving. And when we see that we love others because he loved us that way, it will change and it will be evidence. Now, what was the thought that I was going to give? It's simply this. The scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, where we open. So, dear brothers and sisters, Work hard to prove that you are really among those who God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear me. Work hard to prove that you really are among those who God has caused, called and chosen. What is important for you to know, family? is that the evidence and the proof that we are talking about is not for others. It's so that heaven sees and you have assurance of your salvation. How do you, you will not fall away. How do you have an assurance of your salvation when you are growing in these areas? It is proof and it is evidence that this thing took root in your heart. There are some people who, who come to church for, for years and years and years, but they're still not sure if they're saved. And the reason why they're not sure is because they have no evidence. It's not because someone pointed at them and said, I don't see evidence in your life. It's because they themselves don't, are not pursuing intentional growth. And because they're not growing, now their salvation is in question. But the scripture says, if you live in this way and these things are increasing in your life, there is an expectation at the end of your life. You will receive a grand entrance into heaven, into the kingdom of God. It does not say that the expectation is others will see. There are scriptures that speak about how others will see. Let your good works shine before men, Matthew chapter 5, so that the others will glorify your Father who is in heaven. We're not just talking about the otherness, the other people, what other people see. What we're actually talking about, when we're talking about intentional growth, is what you know, the assurance of your salvation and the fact that heaven sees that you are being intentional and submissive in these areas. Guess what you can expect to hear? Well done good and faithful servant. Let's pursue intentional growth.